admin. Yeah, you can go and let people in. Let's see. All right, guys, let people filter in for a few minutes here and then we'll get started. You guys have me full screen? All right, y'all, we'll get started. Um, I'll let people just keep filtering in as, as they come. So my name is Alex. I am um, one of the lead, the lead coordinator for GoMe. You guys have seen me on some of our prior talks, and I'll just begin as introduced. Um, Sarah is also helping moderate this talk, and she'll moderate the question and answer at the end. Um, as usual, uh, you guys are welcome to turn on your videos, um, put your institutional name, um, change your name to your institutional name as well. Um, you can put your questions in the chat and Sarah and I will take care of them, compile them into a question and answer list. And once Dr. Clark has finished giving his talk, we will uh, ask those questions for you and put them all on our website along with the recording. So you guys know us, we're GOMI, uh, Wilderness Medicine Educational Lecture Series. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and check out our website for recordings of all of our um, past talks and um, schedule for our future talks. Our mission, you guys have heard, is to just share kind of the wide breadth of wilderness and emergency medicine, austere medicine, and um, just get all the awesome talk speakers out there to let us know uh, the really cool careers we can do with wilderness medicine. Our fall lineup, you guys can see here, we are uh, get, getting a little bit more, half, more than halfway through. Uh, we have a really cool talk next week as well from um, one of our tactical medicine speakers. Um, and we'll finish up with a um, fellowship showcase, uh, more info to come about that pretty soon, and a few more talks to finish off 2021. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Clark. So he is an adjunct associate professor of neurology and space medicine at Baylor. He served for 27 years of active duty with the Navy. He qualified as a naval flight officer, flight surgeon, Navy diver, army parachutist, and special forces military freefall parachutist. He worked at NASA from 97 to 2005 and was a space shuttle crew surgeon on six missions. He was chief of the medical operations branch and senior FAA examiner, um, which is related to our talk last week from Dr. Northrop. He was the space medicine advisor to the National Space Biomedical Research Institute from 2005 to 2017. And in 2008, he was an expedition physician supporting the Houghton Mars Project on Devon Island in the high Canadian Arctic. He served as CMO for multiple companies, um, the orbital space company Excalibur Almaz from 20, 2007 to 2012, and uh, currently with the Inspiration Mars Foundation since 2013. Um, the topic of our talk today is these um, high altitude balloons, and Dr. Clark uh, is qualified to speak because he was the medical director of the Red Bull Stratus Project, which in 2012 accomplished the highest stratospheric freefall from 127,000 feet. Uh, achieved supersonic flight at over Mach 1, 840 miles an hour, and then did it again later with Stratex from even higher um, and just about as fast. He's currently consultant for a number of companies, including Virgin Galactic, Heinlein Price Trust, Paragon Space Development Corps, JAG Human Performance, Space Perspectives, Operator Solutions, and the Foundation for Aerospace Safety and Training. He's board certified in neurology and aerospace medicine and is a fellow of the American Aerospace 
Medical Association. So we're super lucky to have Dr. Clark with us today and I'll pass it over to you, sir, and take it away. Cool, can't wait. To, uh, I'm gonna have to go through stuff uh, exceptionally fast just because I am, uh, uh, I like to go through a historical overview. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and get going here. Um, you, you already heard my disclosure slides and I always uh, I'm representing myself and not any of the institutions I'm affiliated with. Um, I always like to start with, uh, especially for, for spaceflight, is what are some of the similarities between wilderness medicine, which I'm a very avid practitioner, and also, uh, you know, uh, space operations. And I've gone from, you know, missions, supporting missions that were in the Mars planning stage to now <laughs> stratospheric balloons, which are not quite space. It's, it's, it's what we call near space. But we all have the same constraints, uh, it just in some, some differences, isolated remote environments, resource limitations, which include uh, people equipment, procedures and training, uh, communication and navigation constraints. Um, our, our programs that were out in the middle of uh, New Mexico, uh, we were continuously having uh, comm and uh, GPS dropouts because of jamming uh, activities that the military does out there. The environment itself, you know, it, whether it's undersea or uh, extreme altitudes um, um, terrestrially or in the, the atmosphere itself. And a big part of it as a preventive medicine specialist is to, is to do everything you can up front to prevent a problem rather than having to deal with it downstream. So I'll talk a little bit about that, just a kind of a basic review of the uh, Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, depending on if you're a basketball or a soccer player, it's like three sheets of paper on a ball, a, a soccer ball. Imagine that. And the first sheet is about 110,000. The second sheet goes up to 220,000. And the third sheet's 330,000. And that, at that top of that third sheet, 330,000 feet uh, or 100 kilometers, that's uh, basically the, the, the edge of space. So when we're doing stratospheric operations, we're in this lower part. And just to kind of review the atmospheric layers, you know, the troposphere, which is where all the most of the weather occurs, goes up to, you know, 30,000 feet or so. The tropopause, which is the, the boundary layer, is, uh, is right at, at the border of 50,000 feet. It actually is a little thicker at the uh, equator um, because of the centrifugal forces. And the stratosphere is everything um, up to the, you know, um, uh, the, the area at least that we're in the, the, the domain in is, is, is right at that uh, second and third sheet of paper. And most of what we're gonna deal with is the lower stratosphere. And the one thing about, as you know, when you go up an altitude, you know, whether you're in an airplane or, or climbing, the temperature drops maybe about three and a half degrees per thousand feet, something like that. In the stratosphere, it actually starts to warm up. So the coldest area is right at the, in that region between the stratosphere and the, and the troposphere. Um, but as you go up, uh, because of the ozone layer uh, and the closer proximity, the lack of uh, air uh, fil filtering out the, uh, the sun's rays, it actually warms up. Um, we won't talk about the mesosphere and thermosphere, but basically there's another um, temperature uh, reduction uh, in the mesosphere and then the thermosphere goes back up again. Um, you know, when we deal with threats, I always kind of like to start out with the perspective of what it what what happens if you don't have something. And the thing universally that will kill you the fastest is an absence of atmospheric pressure. Uh, believe it or not, you can survive without oxygen for quite a few minutes. You'll see these uh, breath hole dives. Uh, David Blaine, you know, the magicians held his breath for 17 minutes. Um, uh, Kate Winslet film in Avatar 2 held her breath for over seven minutes. Um, so we can go without oxygen, but going without pressure is going to kill you faster than pretty much anything else. Um, we can, we need thermal protection within a couple of hours, water, you know, uh, although people may have gone for longer days, food weeks to months, and uh, gravity, which is something we face in the the absence of in the um, space domain, uh, we've had people, there's been over, there's three people that have been over 800 uh, days in space. That's equivalent to what a Mars mission would be. And quite a few, over 20 that have gone over 500 days. So 
gravity isn't the absence of gravity. It's almost there. Now I wanted to. I'm going to play a video here. This is an uh, a, an altitude chamber vacuum chamber test run, uh, in a in a place that we're doing research in, um, out in Midland, Texas. And it's there are two plexiglass chambers, an eight person and a and a two person chamber. And uh, what we do as a demo is we put a, a a tray of water in there, and the physiologic equivalent of space from the early days of the space program was defined as the vapor pressure point of water. So it, uh, water uh, spontaneously boils at 47 millimeters of mercury. That's in your pulmonary gas equation. And um, that was always the definition of space physiologically. And what we found over a few years of looking at this is that we think that there's an, an area of domain about twice the altitude of Armstrong's line, which is the vapor pressure of water. 120,000 feet water boils and freezes simultaneously. So imagine the physiologic consequence of that. So take a look at this tray. Holy shit. Oh my God. And it's so cool. We, we actually make this space ice and then you, and make a drink at, with it afterwards, but you'll see a tray with, you'll see frozen bubbles there. So above 120,000 feet, which is where we were in these parachute programs, you, if you lose the suit pressure integrity, um, your, 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 your water in the, your body will boil and freeze. So just a quick overview, we st first left the planet, uh, you know, in the aerial domain in 1783. And it, within a week, there were both hot air and, um, lifting gas balloons, um, in other words, hy hydrogen balloons. And, and throughout the, uh, the um, uh, 80, uh, 1800s, there were flights up into the lower part, just, be just below the stratosphere that started to recognize that there were some serious maladies that would develop there. And uh, this was one of the articles of, uh, it, in fact, there's a, a really cool, um, Docu, um, docudrama called uh, The Aeronauts, which goes through some of the historical aspects of this. Um, and actually a few years later in 1875, the first fatality attributed to balloon sickness, which is what it was called at the time. Now it's, it's a multitude of factors. It's not just a lack of oxygen. It's actually bubbles that we, we uh, can have as you reduce atmospheric pressure, you can have bubbles coming out of the, your system uh, from saturated nitrogen in your tissue, you can have uh, at higher altitudes, uh, as you can see, you can have bubbles from water vapor. And if you uh, rapidly expand, like say you lose pressure in a capsule or a spacesuit, um, you can have barotrauma, which causes uh, arterial gas embolization into the into the brain and, and the uh, cardiac system. Just kind of a brief review of the uh, access to space via lighter than air systems. Uh, there are tethered ones, free flyers, uh, both lifting gas and hot, and, um, hot air. Uh, many of you might have had a hot air balloon experience. I've got quite a few uh, hours in hot air balloons, and they're really wonderful. And then you can actually combine the two, although the de Rossier, who was the inventor of this, died in a mishap where he was using hydrogen and hot uh, burning gas for obvious reasons. Um, you can launch them from pretty much any platform. Uh, you know, obviously we use land a lot, but there have been um, maritime launches as well as airborne launches. And the payloads that uh, are carried are uh, a huge variety of scientific payloads. Even to this day, all the uh, space programs have balloon test uh, operations. And NASA uses a, a, a test facility uh, in um, New Mexico near Roswell, where we were, were using, and they also use the uh, um, Australia and, and um, looking at polar uh, uh, winds. Um, but you can see that pretty much any of these, uh, any of these scientific platforms can be, uh, you know, utilized because you get high enough, you don't have the same atmospheric attenuation. So astronomy payloads are very popular. Uh, they're, believe it or not, in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s, they were actually uh, used uh, nuclear, they detonated nuclear weapons, which if it would happen this day and age, it would, it would cause serious damage to our electronic systems. 
And there was a huge number of programs that were classified at the time trying to detect nuclear weapon detonation in the, uh, you know, in, against the Soviet Union. Um, payloads can go as high as four tons, which is amazing, but uh, they don't go that as to the super high altitudes. And there's been balloons uh, that are in excess of 100 and um, uh, over 160,000 feet. That's right at the limit of getting up uh, um, up there. So these things can get quite high in the stratosphere. And there, there, there have been balloons that have gone, you know, in excess of or close to two years in duration. But you can't do all, all of them simultaneously. One of the big advances that's been made in uh, long duration ballooning is station keeping. I, I, I won't be able to talk too much about that. Um, humans first descended in the stratosphere in balloons in the 1930s. This was really the first space race. And um, um, many countries in Europe and the Soviet Union and the US uh, were launching stratospheric balloons um, for um, research and also for national pride. Here, here you can see the Russian uh, balloon program. Um, there was a predecessor to that, Osavakim, where all three of the crew perished when the balloon ruptured. These were balloons that were made of uh, rubberized uh, canvas. So they were very fragile when they got into the cold domain of, of the stratosphere. Um, so there was a multitude of scientific balloons that were flown to look at uh, cosmic rays. There was a big battle between Millikan and Compton about what, what was the origin of, of uh, cosmic rays. And there, there was actually a mouse model for cosmic rays that were flown um, in the later years where if a mouse got hit with a cosmic ray, his hair follicle would turn from black to white. Um, the first woman to reach the stratosphere was in uh, 1934. Um, uh, she was the uh, wife of the uh, Jean, Picard, uh, Jean Picard, who was a famous Swiss uh, um, scientist. And his wife was actually the pilot. She was the qualified pilot to take him up. Um, there were a number of programs that were uh, both a uh, combination of uh, non-government and government organizations to launch into the stratosphere. And uh, many of these collected uh, huge amounts of information from on science, but all, almost as importantly on the human itself. Um, both the Air, US Air Force and uh, Navy conducted stratospheric balloon programs in the late 50s and early 60s. And so, uh, two of the Manhai projects stayed up for over 24 hours above 100,000 feet. Stargazer was a atmospheric astronomy uh, package that was a Navy Army program. And uh, uh, tests of high altitude escape systems were also um, done. This was Project Excelsior who uh, uh, tested, did three flights into the stratosphere and uh, tested uh, uh, pressure suit and free fall uh, from 100, 000, over 100,000 feet. Um, at the same time, the Russians had a similar program to test their escape systems. This is actually a balloon capsule, but it's essentially a modified Soviet Vostok capsule and uh, sent two crew members up and um, what, they were both testing free fall uh, uh, descent. Um, one went out with an ejection seat and survived and the one that bailed out uh, as he uh, bailed out, his helmet hit the side of the hatch and uh, punched a hole in it, and he perished from uh, high altitude exposure of, of, of ebulism. Um, and then there was a civilian program in 1966 where a civilian uh, parachutist uh, talked to the David Clark Suit Company into loaning a suit, and he, um, he also perished uh, when his uh, suit lost pressure integrity. Um, so this was always something that we spent a lot of time looking at the historical lessons learned from that. So we would not make anything that other uh, previous uh, folks had. Um, this is a science, a popular science article in 19 or 2008 that came out and talked about diving from space. And then within a very short period of time, the um, Red Bull Stratus started. It actually had, the idea probably was around the same time as that article came out. And then uh, Felix Baumgartner, who was a professional uh, Red Bull athlete, talked to a guy who was the head of the company into funding a, a stratospheric freefall attempt. And uh, Felix was able to get Joe Kittinger, the guy that had done it in 1960, to be the chief technical advisor. Um, 
one of the reasons that we wanted to do that was that the lessons learned from those the high altitude jump of Excelsior was actually a partial pressure suit and it was what we would consider relatively primitive. So Rebel Stratus had some uh, major technical objectives, um, which would expand the altitude that you could do a free fall, demonstrated a, a successful free fall. And uh, Felix, because he wanted to go as fast as possible, actually wanted to free fall and not use a stabilization drogue chute. And we'll get into that in a little bit later. Um, there were a lot of a, a huge number of technical advances, including the pressure suit itself and changing it from a sitting position like aircraft pressure suits use to a free fall body position. There was a lot of development integrating this. Uh, whenever you do a space operation, there's a lot of integration between the different components. And so we had a, a deceleration system, which was the parachute system, had to be integrated with the pressure suit. And you also had to have it integrate with the life support system. And because the decision was to use a capsule on the way up for safety reasons, uh, you had to integrate it with the capsule itself. Um, human factors are uh, ever present in uh, integrating technology with extreme environments. And sure enough, um, on the left here, this parachute system had these uh, very nice, easy to use rings uh, with a gloved hand. The problem is that during one of the test jumps, uh, Felix pulled the wrong handle and actually cut away his parachute. Unlike most uh, uh, two parachute uh, free fall parachutes, one parachute will always stay with the, the, uh, um, with the, the harness system, but because of uh, concern about high altitude opening, there was a cutaway for both parachutes. So we ended up going through using standard human factors practice, which is to color code the handles and put them in a location so that just by touch or feel, you could tell which handle you were grabbing. Um, in, invariably, when you're doing environmental extreme um, um, processes, you wanna start in a uh, relative safe environment. So the best way to start is in the parachute realm is to use a vertical wind tunnel. These are available, even your kids uh, can go in them. And um, this is a, a Felix in the suit um, practicing in a vertical wind tunnel. Um, we did this for both the Red Bull Stratus and the second uh, program, the, the Stratic Space Dive, did extensive vertical. Um, uh, we tested in low altitude regimes. I skipped through the, the uh, bungee jump just for, in the interest of time, but we tested all aspects of the, of the um, entire mission in, in, in separate increments to make sure that we had a, a good understanding of it. This was a uh, high altitude uh, parachute drop at around uh, 28,000 feet. And it would demonstrate that Felix could um, successfully do all of the various maneuvers that you'd have to do in, in free fall, including opening his parachute. Um, we did um, um, multiple tests starting at lower altitudes after we'd done the vertical wind tunnel and then advanced to the uh, uh, free fall from the, you know, the, the mid uh, troposphere. Um, the other thing we like to do is especially testing systems in the environmental extremes. This is a thermal vacuum chamber. There's not a whole lot of these. NASA has one and the Air Force has one. Um, this is now in the hands of uh, the civilian program. So you, you can use that if you, uh, if you schedule it ahead of time. So we wanted to test the, the capsule system in, in the extreme cold and also at a low atmospheric pressure. So the capsule was put inside the uh, uh, thermal vacuum chamber. And then uh, we did, <laughs> there were so many lessons learned that we actually did this over three years. So 2010, 2011, 2012, we did uh, six thermal vacuum runs to get everything checked out. And um, one of the issues is that um, you use advanced technology, but it also encumbers some you and so in the second free fall program the decision was made to go without a capsule um, one of the things that we start early on is the how do we do the command and control and how to how to monitor the environment um, because every it's, it's one person out there on his own and so you really need a, a, a multiple sets of uh, eyes and technical representatives to look at each of those systems so 
based on the um, military flight test experience and the NASA flight test uh, experience, we developed a mission control that was based on the similar principles. Um, and as we got into the, the full up field operations out in Roswell, we ended up you know, with much larger uh, screens and we ended up with um, uh, six people across and six rows back. Of course, there were some people like the FAA and the weather and a whole, whole bunch of other disciplines, but this was as compl complex as the uh, Mission Control Center in Houston. Um, this is me at the console. There's uh, the flight director and then Joe Kittinger, who is the main capsule communicator uh, right there in front. Um, along the way, we always try to have a backup to um, whatever could possibly go wrong. And so one of the things that could happen is balloons can rupture. And uh, a rupture of the balloon happens just because this thing is a, it's like, a, it's like the uh, dry cleaning bag material. It's a couple of mils thick, very, very thin. You can punch your, a hole in it with, with you know, your fingernail. And once it gets starts to get inflated, the winds can flop it like a spinnaker and um, and just a, a, a snap of the balloon from a gust of wind can rupture. So we have an emergency system that's developed that in case the balloon ruptures, um, we cut away the uh, the capsule parachute with the balloon uh, separate when the balloon separates this parachute opens up very quickly. Uh, particularly at low altitudes. And there was a lot of work that went into the, the um, system and looking at all of the potential failures. Um, here's a balloon on standup. We did five unmanned flight tests with the capsule and uh, um, various other systems that we would take up. And then we did three stratospheric balloon flights that were separated by about two to three months. Um, one of the things that you're uh, um, you know, you're constrained by is the launch system. And this is a dynamic launch system that is used by the Air Force. In fact, this was the Air Force balloon um, team that did this. But what you do is you, you inflate the balloon and you get it to stand up. And then um, as the balloon starts to, to uh, rise in altitude, you've got to move this entire launch crane very actively and basically get it so that the balloon train is, is straight up and that that particular moment you uh, uh, release it. If you let it go at this point right here, you can see that the capsule would swing down and impact the ground. And there you see a successful launch. Now this is the, actually what we call the black zone. It's the worst possible time because um, if you had a low altitude balloon failure, a catastrophic failure, what would happen is you would have to, you have two choices, cut the balloon away from and have the crew parachute open. Uh, and, or the other option is, which is something we actually practice for is that Felix would rapidly disconnect, open the hatch and bail out. He was a base jumper, which is a low altitude parachutist, but it still took 13 seconds to get the hatch and all of the hoses disconnected. One of the things I was really, um, you know, honored to be a part of was to um, um, bring on um, a bunch of med students and residents. So um, we had somewhere on the order of six, um, six uh, residents and med students on our team. Uh, and also we had several physicians. We had a ventilator tech here and we had uh, a, a, a rescue paramedic. So we had a multitude of different folks on our team. We also had physiologists, sports psychologists, and other folks. And amazingly, as residents, most of these folks have now gone into the space program and many are at NASA, which is kind of cool. This just shows you some of the, uh, what folks did at, in the aftermath of it. The, the, the way I did this was I assigned each one of them to a specific area or they picked the area they wanted to, to be the lead on. And then they would become the first author on the articles that came out of this. By the way, I have all these articles available if you're interested. One of the things that I didn't realize was gonna be as big a, a deal was it, we would have to brief Felix on all of the uh, environmental threats that we face throughout the mission at all these different phases. Now as a base jumper, he doesn't, he just wears one parachute and if it fails, he dies. But um, one of the things that we uh, 
inadvertently uh, did was by giving Felix all of the thousand ways he could die. Um, I think it kind of messed up his mind and you can almost see him there like going, you know, am I sure I'm ready to do this? And actually there was a period of time where he actually had to go through as much uh, as we put an emphasis on physical training, we had to go through um, uh, mental health preparedness, you know, basically how to face the unknown that he was, he was getting into. Um, again, I put a big emphasis on doing everything you can ahead of time. You know, the strength and conditioning because of uh, trying to move in a pressure suit that's inflated is really challenging. Um, one of the big challenges that, um, in fact, everybody that does pressure suit or spacesuit operations will talk about that initial period when you put the visor down and, the, and there's a sense of, you know, uh, confinement. Uh, I won't say claustrophobia, but it, it's just something that you're breathing your own air bouncing off the visor. Um, quarantine we did at NASA, it's basically to keep the crew member from getting a cold. You something as simple as common cold in a pressure suit where you're going to have pressure uh, fluctuations can be a killer. W early on, one of the altitude chamber runs he did at the Air Force chamber in uh, Beale Air Force Base, he'd eaten something, uh, I think, you know, like bratwurst and sauerkraut. And if any of you ever had that, you know that you get a lot of gas buildup. And, you know, he had so much gas buildup, it was, a, it was almost a mission termination criteria. We launch early at dawn because that's when the winds are lowest. And so we would have to continually start our crew day around 10 p.m. And if you had a launch slip or a, 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 you know, a, a schedule change, you would have zombies after about four days. So we would have to deal with the fact that we're, we're working at, you know, at an hours of the day that are not um, you know, what we're used to. After every evolution, uh, we would do a, a debrief, including the physiologic data and uh, what we learned from it. Uh, this is Andy Walsh, who was head of human performance at Red Bull um, and Felix. And, you know, we would be very critical about what we could learn from this so we wouldn't have a problem in the actual mission phase. A big part of any endeavor, especially if you know, you're doing a, if you're going to go out in a wilderness environment, if you're going to go, you know, do offshore uh, sailing, if you're going to go do uh, you know, uh, whatever, you got to plan uh, in very heavy detail all the threats that you're going to face. So this was our, our main uh, threat matrix that we came up with. You have an ascent threat, which is like we talked about, a balloon rupture, at a low altitude landing in the in the in the uh, capsule uh, would potentially be injurious. The stratospheric threats, you know, this is the standard one that you most of you know about if you're involved in the. Uh, altitude uh, domain, hypoxia, barotrauma, decompression sickness, all these are related to uh, inadequate uh, tissue perfusion. Uh, but ebulism is a unique threat to the stratosphere itself. In free fall, the things we were most worried about was the flat spin and um, shock waves that can develop when you go through, when you uh, break the speed of sound, there is turbulent airflow and uh, boundary effects that can uh, that really are unknown. And so, for both Felix's jump and Alan Eustace's jump, uh, the transonic transition when you go above Mach 1.0 to Mach 1.2, um, the uh, shock wave formations were something we had really no idea what was gonna, we were going to encounter. And then any parachute jump, you've got potential for landing in injuries. Um, since we were worried about th this high altitude exposure to um, uh, vacuum, the primary insult is damage to the lungs. So we developed a, uh, a protocol that used a high frequency percussive ventilator to treat the lung damage based on the pathology that we saw from other human ebulism exposures. And this is just some of the testing that we were doing. And then flight certification, we carried one of these high frequency percussive ventilators on all, both our air uh, recovery teams and our ground recovery teams. Um, and this was the article, um, Dan Murray was an Air Force major who was a resident at UTMB and he uh, had wanted to do this, this particular phase of it. So he wrote the, the lead article on this. The other main physiologic threat we faced in the stratosphere during reentry is a flat spin. We know in the, the Air Force, uh, prelude to Excelsior that they used uh, uh, instrumented mannequins. Uh, they did a hundred of these balloon flights 
and carried two, you can see there's two mannequins facing each other. One would carry a drug chute and one wouldn't. So we were able to uh, access all of that data and come up with our analysis on it. Um, basically, that would say that you're in a much better configuration if you use a drogue chute. Um, he, the uh, Air Force also did um, spin tests on um, actual humans and, al and also animals. And they would spin them at various um, speeds and various durations uh, and their physiologic endpoint for a, a damage was uh, subconjunctival hemorrhages. We, we probably couldn't do these experiments now. So the variables that you can do are basically to change the axis of rotation. So here you would see the axis of rotation would be <coughs> roughly through the abdomen. And what they were able to come up with was a dose response curve that would say, okay, where, uh, where will we get these subconjunctival hemorrhages? And this is the axis, the uh, time axis is on the Y axis and RPM or rotation speed is on the X axis. And so if you rotate around the abdomen, you get about half as much tolerance as you do by rotating around the chest. And where this came into play was where we would put a drug chute in the event of, of a spin. And so we came up with how we, you know, obviously we wanna move the uh, axis of rotation as high up on the body as possible. Now, what that does is if you're in a spin, all the blood's pooling in your lower extremities. That's a far more um, tolerable event, even though you'll have loss of consciousness than an, than a headward fluid shift by having a lower axis of rotation. That lower axis of rotation would, in centrifugal force terms, would cause a headward fluid shift, essentially um, like a, um, a, a um, massive uh, hypertensive crisis. And would, uh, if it's gonna rupture blood vessels in your uh, subconjunctiva, that's recoverable. But if it ruptures them in your brain, uh, in our cranial cavity, that's not. So um, even though we had no intent to actually, in a nominal scenario, jump with a drug shoot, we had a multitude of drug shoot tests that we did, including a drop test that we did. Um, this is a center of mass on the abdomen, and we opted to go with a high center of mass um, rotation. So you can see here what the, uh, the, the drug is, is a much higher up on the body. Um, now, Felix was not gonna use a drogue, but we had one available should he need one, either from an excessive spin, he could trigger a drogue with this little push button. And he, there was an also a sensor in, on his wrist in the same location that we pre-calculated would be if, if he passed out, it would fire the drogue automatically, even if he was incapacitated. And then here's some of the articles that we uh, had on the emergency uh, contingency response. Um, like anything else, what we're trying to do is to get assets as quickly as possible to the location that it's needed. So um, we would uh, basically try to make sure that the, uh, um, the teams that were in the field had the best position location information. Um, so it was always about good communication, pushing things forward. Um, and uh, we would use um, a met. We had we would have a, a, a we had three uh, three to four helicopters for Red Bull, including one that had a GPS tracking system that uh, at the time was pretty you know cutting edge where we could track his location. Um, and and one of the helicopters was a full up dedicated medevac helicopter which carried one of the physicians on board. Um, I'm going to show you the video because this is something that's not often shown out there, but what you're going to see there is a lot of information. You're going to see heart rate and respiratory rate here on the bottom left, airspeed and altitude on uh, what we call analog gauges or steam gauges, a heads up display tape that shows uh, airspeed on the left and altitude on the right. Um, this is the um, g-force over time and the speed over time. And then this is a center of mass where his column of blood is. When he's standing up on the uh, porch of the capsule, 
the one G is to his feet, but as he skits into his spin, as you'll see, this the little red dot moves up into his head. Um, and here's the uh, here's the tape, and we'll, we'll just go through this real quick. Bottom line is, in about uh, 30 seconds, he reaches Mach one, and he's in. Uh, he is uh, over Mach one for 30 seconds, and at the end of the uh, Mach one. As he starts to decelerate, he gets into an inverted flat spin that's pretty aggressive. You know, at 15 seconds, he's already doing 350 miles an hour. At about one minute, he reaches block one. Um, this is the physiologic data. The hardest thing on his uh, cardio uh, respiratory system was actually standing up from a sitting position or a almost an inclined position with a heavy backpack on in an inflated pressure seat. And his heart rate got up to you know the, the high 180s. Um, and um, he, he kept a, a pretty high heart rate, well in excess of 160 uh, beats per minute all the way um, uh, during the free fall, in part because of the spin uh, effects. Um, this was in um, uh, actually um, the anniversary of Chuck Yeager's, uh, 65th anniversary of Chuck Yeager's speed of sound breaking. And uh, the Federation Aeronautic International sets records. And you can see that Felix broke uh, the highest altitude, the highest uh, free fall distance, and the highest speed here. Um, and uh, did a stand-up landing really nice on Chuck Yeager's anniversary. But one of the things at the, uh, at the analysis afterwards was that Joe Kittinger says, look, you know, no matter how good he is, um, he could not stay stable. And he was a very experienced skydiver. So the idea of uh, doing jumps without a stabilization drogue shoot was really ill-advised. Um, so there was a, a major data transfer um, to the next team, Stratic Space Dive. They started around um, 2011 and 2012. We had a major data transfer. I was lucky enough to be the um, uh, lead physician medical director for both these programs. Alan Eustace was a Google executive who had said, I'd like to develop a, a scuba system for the stratosphere. In other words, you put it on and you can uh, go out. And he, he was a, a, a relatively experienced skydiver. He was in his late 50s and he, was, he only had a couple hundred jumps at the time. Um, we got a new space suit. Instead of the David Clark suit, we used an ILC Dover suit, which makes the uh, extravehicular mobility suit uh, for, for NASA. Um, it's a much bulkier suit. It's a it's got a hard upper torso, uh, and it's got a dome helmet. A lot of uh, engineering that goes into this. Same kind of thing. Test in austere environments that are safe, like a, a thermal chamber on the ground, a vacuum chamber. We did all that. One of the things we were gonna we spent a huge amount of effort on is the development of the uh, drogue chutes. and the drogue had to withstand opening forces. And so these these are um, cement filled tubes that we use to test the different parachutes and some of them worked and some of them didn't. That's a pair, a drug parachute that failed and that little cement pole went into the ground um, unrecovered from that. A huge amount of work went into the uh, assessment of the drug systems, both the the size of the drogue parachute, the tether length, and we all we optim we obviously wanted to get a high high, high placement as well. 
we uh, we did two stratospheric dummy drops, um, which had not been done at this altitude. And the first one, because it had a center of around the body center, uh, it got up to 150 plus RPM, which would have been probably fatal. Um, so we had we went back, and that's that's when we were absolutely sure we needed to change some of the uh, drug characteristics. And this is only done by test and evaluation. The other thing is that the drug was going to deploy very early on, and um, what you have to worry about in the initial uh, free fall phase is that the drug itself can wrap around you, and that had actually happened to Joe Kittinger on his first jump uh, in 1960, and he was rendered unconscious by the drug chute itself. So a lot of airborne testing. Here you can see the free fall testing. The, the downside is that because the heavy mass of uh, the life support system, uh, we had some really hard landings. And that's not the kind of landing you like to see. Um, anyway, two years and 10 days after Felix's jump, Alan made a successful jump to uh, an altitude about 8,000 feet above Felix's altitude. He got to close to the same speed of Felix, but because he was using a drug chute, he didn't get as high. Look at the size of this balloon there. These balloons were on the order of 20 uh, acres of material. Um, here was our crew recovery assets. We started to use, we, had, we added a fixed wing uh, aircraft so that it had a longer loiter time. And also we deployed a, 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 a uh, airborne parachute um, recovery team member. Um, just some quick stuff on that. Alan's record got to close to 136,000 feet or over 41 kilometers, much higher free fall distance and, and his speed was just uh, 20 miles slower than Felix's. There's our team, same, we have, we have the same medical team for both uh, missions. I'll just go through that. Anyway, uh, these two programs de demonstrated the importance of drug chute stabilization for future flights. So where are we now? Um, well, I like to think that what we do in our domain is to turn science fiction into science fact. This was a cover in 1934. And um, uh, basically, um, 80 years later, Alan in 2014 did it. Uh, he, he turned science fiction into science fact. Um, you know, just like there are a lot of, of uh, space movies that show decompression uh, suits, uh, ruptures, and ebulism, um, there now are, are uh, movies that are using high altitude balloons. And this was one. Uh, it's called Kingsman, the Secret Service, and they actually consulted with the Red Bull Stratus team on stuff. And amazingly, this system, uh, which is a crew-worn uh, life support system, uh, two balloons, that, believe it or not, there are uh, scenarios where you can use two balloons. There's disadvantages, but there's also advantages. But this, this, is, uh, this is where now science fiction is following science fact, Ad Astra, and a number of other ones. So here it is, 20, 2015, Popular Science Does It Again, talks about you know, where the future is. And the, the reason that near space or the stratospheric operations are so viable is that at 40 kilometers where you are in near space, you're in this dotted line here and the curvature of the earth at, um, at, a, at 40 kilometers, I'm sorry, is the dash line and the curvature of the Earth at 100 kilometers where Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic go is, this, is pretty much the same curvature. 400 kilometers is where Space Station is. And so it's a much more prominent curvature, but you can get the same view of the Earth from 40 kilometers in a balloon at a lot less expense and a lot less risk. There, this is a company in Barcelona that's doing stratospheric balloon. Uh, they want to develop humans, but right now they're doing stuff like launching rockets and stuff. But their their goal is to launch people from it. Um, Worldview had started in this domain early on and tested it and deployed the highest altitude of deployment of a parafoil over 100,000 feet. And they are able to do station keeping uh, where they basically can uh, launch a balloon and keep it over uh, th this is over the uh, um, several regions of the West, um, 
using a, a ballast system, which I won't get into. And the company that I work for is uh, Space Perspectives based out of uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida. And um, we've, uh, we've done a test flight uh, just this uh, few months ago in June. The goal is to take up in a large nice uh, capsule, um, eight participants and one pilot for a, a six hour flight. And the, it launches from the Gulf Coast. This is Cape Camp Canaveral where Kennedy Space Center is. Uh, uh, launch from uh, airports along the East Coast. And then depending on the uh, stratospheric winds, either go out and land in the Atlantic or the, or the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that's the concept. Um, this, these, this is a, a picture from the balloon of the cap, uh, capsule mock-up. And this was um, just a, a few months ago, 18 June, where we uh, launched a balloon up to 100,000 feet to test all of the uh, avionics systems and tracking and recovery. Um, and uh, this was a photo, there's a video as well, but you can see a really nice curvature of the earth there. And actually, because you're closer, you can see a lot more uh, than you would be at, at 100 kilometers. And quite honestly, a, a suborbital flight is five minutes of microgravity, and this is six hours. So um, this is another company I work for, which is uh, Operator Solutions. This is made up of Air Force pararescue uh, folks, and we've developed a commercial version of the same recovery system that's used by uh, the uh, SpaceX uh, NASA missions. Um, airborne, we have, uh, we're now in the process of uh, getting a C-130, but we have uh, Sikorsky 76s, which are a nice platform, and we also have uh, rigid inflatable boats that are deployed from this. Uh, the Go America and the Go Freedom is the same. Guy Soft Shore is the same company that provides the Go Searcher for, for SpaceX. So that's just a kind of a quick where we're going and what we're doing. I have a, a number of references that um, I'll send all these uh, slides out to you all if you are interested in some of the, the early history. Tom Crouch's book, who's at, he's at the Nation, uh, National Air and Space Museum. Uh, Race to the Stratosphere. This is about uh, Project Manhigh. This is a great book, um, Pre-Astronauts, about uh, scientific ballooning. Uh, Stratonauts, a nice book. Um, I have I have Stratonauts electronically. Uh, I don't have this one electronically, the Stratospheric Balloon one. Um, um, these are two other books. This is a book, The Wild Black Yonder, was written about all of the technical obstacles that we faced in Stratix. Dressing for Altitude is a great book on pressure suits. I have that electronically. And then this is a, a, a chapter I wrote on balloon, stratospheric balloons and uh, how they have aided uh, human spaceflight. And that is in Handbook of Bioastronautics. So I have that electronically too. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close and maybe have a time for some questions. Does anyone in the audience have any questions? And you can go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself as long as you're not talking over anyone else. And while we, we have a couple questions uh, recorded from the from the chat too but thanks again dr clark that was that was a really really cool talk sarah do you want to take some of the questions we've gotten on our uh, on our google doc i will do that so was felix getting 100 percent oxygen or air during his fall yeah great question so an interesting um thing um, the suit, the, the capsule that went up was at 16,000 foot equivalent altitude. And so we, we have to keep the capsule environment uh, in a safe uh, area. So what we have is a combination of oxygen and nitrogen, but the suit at all times that he was breathing was 100% oxygen. And there's several reasons for that. One is if you have a depressurization um, you you want to make sure he's maximally covered, and by that I mean a, a depressurization of the capsule. But more importantly, is because the suit is at uh, 3.5 psi or 35,000 foot equivalent, we face the risk of decompression sickness. And 35,000 feet is a pretty aggressive area. So the bottom line is that he would be breathing oxygen 
somewhere on the order of, you know, a several hours before the flight to denitrogenate. And it's the same kind of protocol that we use for U2 pilots before they fly, you know, up in the, they fly in this, they fly at 30,000 foot, they fly at about 70,000 foot altitude, but their cabin pressure is, is around 25 to 30,000. So you're always breathing oxygen even before you go to denitrogenate. So you uh, reduce your risk of decompression sickness. And we spent a lot of time in modeling what the decompression sickness risk was. So 100% the whole way and all the way down. Uh, so is it, do, did you, do you kind of derive from diaphysiology in a way to figure out? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and if you, any of you are interested, I've got a book chapter uh, it's um, in Principles of Clinical Medicine for Spaceflight on Decompression Disorders. And uh, both me, I, was a, I, I did diving, I ran a hyperbaric department and chamber for three years in the Navy. So I had a pretty, you know, I'd say a, a, at least a passing uh, familiarity with diving medicine. Um, but yes, absolutely. The DCS risk, Altitude exposure is much less than the, it is for diving. For example, there's only been 18 people who died of altitude decompression sickness compared to, you know, many, many thousands in the diving world. And then I just wanted to clarify about the suit. You said 3.5 PSI and 35,000 foot equivalent. Is that accurate? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can get my little chart out if, if you want to. I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's in that ballpark. There's a little chart here and I, I can make this stuff available to you. It's the atmospheric pressure table. And um, if you look up 35,000 feet, um, yeah, it's about, it's about 3.5 PSI. So Clark suit, that's the suit pressure that they operate at. And 35,000 feet, if you, if you just went from sea level to 35,000 feet, um, even with 100% oxygen, breathing 100% oxygen, you get enough oxygen to maintain an alveolar gas that, that's compatible with life. But you're, because of the reduced ambient pressure, your body is going to start off-gassing nitrogen into your uh, tissues and bloodstream. So DCS risk is, is, a, is a very much of a problem, even though hypoxia wouldn't be. So does that make sense? Yes. Um, and then what was the rough overall budget of this project and were there government approvals necessary, which clearly. Well, you know, th there is no official announcement of it. Um, but I mean, you, I've done the math, you know, like how many pressure suits, you know, Red Bull had three pressure suits. Um, you know, they needed them for testing and all. They, those are $300,000, $350,000 a piece. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the gas itself would be roughly $100,000 per mission. That's just the gas, the helium, to take the balloon up. And we did um, eight, eight flights, or, you know, test flight, three, five test flights and three human flights. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I figure it's in the ballpark of 35 to 40 million for Red Bull. And for um, Alan's flight, again, there's no, you know, it's my kind of guesstimate is, is, is about half that. And it was about half the time. Why? Because we learned a lot from Red Bull. And uh, also, they didn't have the complexity of a capsule system. So, they're, they're, you know, cost is always an issue. Um, now, the company Space Perspectives is they're they're targeting 125k for a six-hour balloon flight, and people could fly. You could fly an astronomy payload, or you know, all kinds of uh, you know cool stuff. So, six hours is a lot better. For, and and right now, Virgin Galactic saying 450 for a suborbital, basically. Um, you know, five minutes of microgravity and a couple of hours of, you know, launch uh, prep and getting up to, to, to the 50,000 foot drop altitude. And then what sort of upper body, body training? I just noticed in the video, like he was inverted and the resistance was all in his shoulders and his arms, it appeared. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, so, so what, that's a good question. So we, we approached it both with Alan and with Felix, a very intensive program of everything. Um, essentially, they're extreme athletes. So you want to have good aerobic capacity uh, you, and, and, and endurance, but you need upper body strength. It is amazing how hard it is to move in a pressure suit. And the other thing is because Felix was at a 16,000 foot capsule pressure inside on the way up, he was denitrogenating uh, on the way up. With Alan, no capsule, he has to be at a higher pressure suit so that he is not going to be off gas at nitrogen in an advent, uh, disadvantageous way. So his suit pressure was 5.8. And he had a huge amount of problem just moving to, to do different things, including, you know, when you're in free fall, you're falling. And then also you have to pull the uh, parachute release handle. We have an automatic system, but, you know, obviously you want to pull it when you want it to pull it. So strength and conditioning was a huge factor, both aerobic and uh, upper body strength in particular. And then in terms of it's, you know, seeming more common that most likely very wealthy civilians are able to do this. Um, but what is the environmental impact? Are they including that since we've got this big environmental focus going on right now? You know, that's a great question. So, you know, propellants like rocket propellants leave um, upper atmospheric contaminants from uh, incomplete combustion. Um, we're now using helium, but the plan is to use hydrogen. So it's generated from electrolysis and hydrogen is an, you know, it, it, you know, it's a, you know, it makes up our part, our atmosphere as it is, but even helium is, is, is a non-toxic, you know, a compound. We do, we do recover the balloons and then um, there, we have to reprocess them to get them. Uh, but sp Space Perspectives is, is uh, they've got a, a balloons they've, that are made in India, but they're gonna make their own balloons and they're gonna uh, recycle the plastic material. So the reality is for the, you know, the environmental um, footprint of it, it's, it's very small because they're not using toxic chemicals at all. Cool. And they're going to be using helium, hydrogen, which is made from electrolysis. In Europe, because they don't have access, to, we have a helium reserve in the U.S., uh, but there are many countries in Europe that when they do um, gas balloon flights, you know, like the Gordon Bennett flights and all, they use hydrogen. And then is the flat spin in part due to the Coriolis, is that how you pronounce it? Effect? Yeah, the cor so the Coriolis effect is um, when the earth that we are on is spinning and it's it makes a revolution in a day. And, you know, if you take the circumference of the equator, you know, say 24,000 miles, basically, if you're at the equator, you're traveling a thousand miles an hour from, you're, you're actually traveling, um, you're traveling from west to east. So the earth is spinning, you know, and, and that's why the, you know, the sun's up there and that's why the, 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 the sun rises in the east and sets in the west is because the earth is spinning from east to west. You see what I mean? So Coriolis is the is the is the uh, force that is related to the, the the Earth's translation over time, and it can affect uh, you know if you shoot a bullet a long distance, it, the Earth is spinning underneath it, even though the bullet is launched and it's in the air. So it, the bottom line to the question in the, or the answer is that the 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 spin is from aerodynamics. Okay, um, and and by that I mean that um, as he's he's falling and he has a, a he's his his speed is, is increasing. It's like when you put your hand out of the car window, you know you you basically and if you if, if any I'm I'm also a, a parachutist too, a sport and a military and 
you know, when you're, when you're free falling, you can control your body by just moving your, the veins of your hand. You know, you can move them in and out and change how fast you fall. You can pull your arms in and put your legs out and you'll go forward. You can put one arm out and you're gonna spin. The problem is in free fall is that they're, and when you go transonic, um, um, whenever they were first flying uh, aircraft in, above the speed of sound, they would get what's called control reversal. So there's something that happens in the airflow. So it's the spin is caused by air, aerodynamic flow uh, irregularities, not from Coriolis. But those are great questions. You guys have, uh, you, you got a lot, you've got a lot of insight already. So anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a niche kind of extreme environment. And it can certainly, you know, mess you up. And obviously, when are doing water landings, we're very concerned about water safety and water survival. So, uh, but that's a nice place to. It's nice to land on water because it's a, at least even with sea states. And we don't launch in high sea states or or you know in bad weather like say a hurricane or something. And but it's a relatively consistent um, force as you enter. The problem with land landings is that the land is not, you know, a flat surface everywhere. And even the, I do an, a, a, an accident analysis space programs. There was a, you know, a Russian capsule that came down on a mountainside and was rolling down the mountain, you know? I mean, you know, so land landings are much more problematic unless, as long as, if, as, long as you know you're gonna land right there, you're okay, you can land in the plains of, you know, the, the central plains of the U.S. and be relatively okay. But by the same token, you can hit, you know, a potentially a power pole or, you know, something that's, you know, hard. So land, land landings, uh, besides being a harder impact, also have uh, terrain features that are so much more variable than the ocean. All right. Well, I think. So, by the way, up. I have um, I have all of the uh, the uh, publications that were done for both the Red Bull and the uh, Stratix programs, and also I have a bunch of space medicine books electronically. If anybody's interested. Yeah, I, everybody was. Because those <laughs> things are expensive. Yeah, so I even have Mike Barrett's book. So that's like a three hundred dollar book. Do you mind if we put your email in the chat and then people can just uh, shoot you a message about this? Yeah, sure. It's a Dropbox file and it's it, I, it's a huge one. I've got Jeff Davis's book on aerospace medicine. I've got a bunch of different books in there. And I've got the books, I've got uh, Dressing for Altitude, my book chapter in Bioastronautics Handbook on ballooning and also um, um, Oh, what was the other one? Um, Stratonauts. I have the Stratonauts book electronically. And someone okay. asked, what's the best way to get all of these? Uh, you can do my ECM email. Yeah, that will work. And then what I'll do is I'll put your email in there and then the it, Dropbox will send you a link that you can access it. I should pull it up. I can, I can pull it up on my computer. Um, the thing is, I have a huge number of files. I have them on, I mean, I have them on uh, aerospace neurology, artificial gravity, crew escape, crew rescue, ebulism, escape suits, extreme environments, gender issues in space, lymphatics, high altitude medicine. I mean, because these are all projects that I'm working with. Uh, ketones, lunar references, Mars references, MRI of extreme environments. That's the other thing. Is what they found is as they've started to study astronauts and U-2 pilots is that they've had, and actually high altitude uh, mountain climbers have, have these things called white matter hyperintensities, which are a very much of a concern. So I have all kinds of stuff. But the one that's, this is the space medicine. Can you see this? No, it's on a different screen. Oh, here, let me, let me, uh, how do I shift screen? 
uh, you could just stop share and reshare or um, share okay. to desktop. Now let's see. Oh, here it is. Yeah, so um, I have fundamentals of space medicine, handbook of operational physiology, humans. This is some NASA stuff, human interface design. These are the NASA, lots of signal, which is about the Columbia mishap, NASA evidence book, neuro lab, principles of clinical medicine, second edition, uh, psychology of space exploration, stratonauts, Space Fairs Handbook, Wings in Orbit. I think, and I, if I don't know, I, I don't see that. Oh, yeah, there's dressing for altitude too. So, yeah, I, I have a ton of different books. And you can just pick, pick the ones you want. They're, they're big enough that you can't email. But Mike Barrett's book, I, you know, that's a, you know, I've got a couple of chapters in that. Um, that's just a great book. And that's a couple hundred dollar book. So, yeah, we're, we really appreciate you uh, sharing these with us. That's 900 pages, <laughs> everything you didn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, th that's a you know, good deal from this. You know, this I'm so glad I connected with you guys. So, um, but yeah, there's th this is, I think, the Mike Barrett's book and Jeff Davis's Jeff Davis's book is more about aerospace medicine, whereas. This is just space medicine, but you can see, I mean, they've got chapters here. Um, the ones I've written are on uh, um, decompression related disorders and um, audiologic, and then the book chapter on neurologic effects of space flight. So, um, you know, so I've got that one and the decompression chapter. So, all righty. Well, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it, or at least kept you, you know. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a really cool talk. I, that was, you know, we, we have these pretty much every week, and that was one of the coolest ones that I've been here for. So thanks so much. Um, I'll reach out about, you know, those resources and how people can get this from you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks a lot, Dr. Clark. You bet. Have a good night, Take everybody. Care. See y'all.